Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. Stop the Lord Almighty. And our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. And our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before him. Stop the Lord Almighty. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord? And our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before Him.
All right, how's everybody doing? Good. You ready for some teamwork today? How many here are a just dish me the, the rock and watch the show kind of players? This is a few. Everybody else a team player? Yeah, okay. We're going to find out today. Uh, actually, you're going to find out today. We're going to let you uh, make it a matter of prayer before the Lord and say, what kind of a team player am I? God has called us to be a team, a big team, and form little teams around special teams, I guess we could call them, around the big team. And uh, God's gifted us all in various ways, and God has so orchestrated that uh, probably uh, none of us should be a, hey, just chuck me the rock and watch the show kind of player, right? Uh, we, uh, we, need, uh, we need teams around us. It could appear, and we commonly talk like uh, Paul the Apostle uh, was just like the guy, you know, and he didn't need anybody else on the planet, and you just like did it. And I think nothing could be further from the truth. And we kind of mislead each other when we talk about Paul went here, he did this, Paul went there, he did that, and like, you know, nobody else was needed. And uh, that's just uh, not the case. Uh, we are at the uh, end of the book of Colossians, and uh, we're seeing uh, part of the team. Uh, Paul almost always, a little time in, um, in Athens, he went ahead of, ahead of some folks. But besides that, basically, he was always with a team. And the different team members would come and go and go off to do other things. And there was teams going on all over the place. And we're going to take a look at that today. And we are hof hopefully uh, going to learn uh, what it is to be a, a team for the Lord. You remember back at Pickup uh, Ball, or actually some of you are playing on teams right now. You get a chance to, uh, to choose your team. And if you're, uh, uh, with soccer's in, uh, happening right now, baseball's happening, and football's happening at the same time, uh, little league, adult league, uh, professionally. And if you're going to choose a team, uh, there are certain things you look for uh, at the community center. We um, are supposed to kind of audition, but everybody kind of knows everybody. But if you're a new guy, you're supposed to go down and, and uh, if you can show everybody which side of the football to hold or that kind of thing, you know, maybe you can make a team. Actually, you've got to be able to breathe to make a team. Uh, then we go up in a room, the captains all do, and we choose uh, teams. Uh, we do that for Little League. We do that for uh, Adult League. And uh, when you're choosing a team, do you want all quarterbacks on the team? that are going to give me the rock kind of guy and everybody else just watch, you know, probably not. You got, you're choosing a team based on being a team, you know, baseball works that way. Hockey is that way. And, uh, there are certain also, uh, attitudes that you want in team members and other attitudes that, uh, you know, might be slightly anti-productive. Does that make sense? Okay. And, and that's a factor as well. You have a really good guy or gal, but, you know, you're going the attitudes like, man, that's just going to, you know, uh, not help the team at all. So a lot of factors we look at in choosing teams. What does God look for in his teams? The big team that he's got right now, little teams. Anybody list anything? Just in, you don't have to say it out loud, but just in, in your mind, what, what's, what are the qualities and practices uh, uh, that God looks for in a team? I got a, I got a very cool list for you. This this kind of um, uh, pulled me in. This is uh, 1 Corinthians. Uh, um, I don't think you have this on your outline. I apologize. going to get to the outline momentarily. Uh, but uh, just the, this is the introduction, so it doesn't need to be on the outline. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verse 26. You can write that at the top of the page. Uh, it says this. Paul's, uh, uh, the Lord, through Paul, is writing to the uh, believers in Corinth, which had kind of a messed up team. But nonetheless... Consider your calling brothers. Be a good time for us right here. Consider uh, different, different folks, uh, you know, our calling, who we were when we were called by, by Jesus to trust him and then be part of his team. That there were not many wise among you, according to the flesh. Not many mighty, not many noble. Why? God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. We've got to really think right now to get our wheels turning. God's made a choice, and he's choosing mostly foolish people, at least in the eyes of the world. Who did Jesus call? Did he go to the local university? If you're going to university, God can still use you. 
And I'm, I, prepare for university. G -g keep going, keep going, okay? But I'm just, I'm just, I got my passage, okay? Uh, not many of you were wise, mighty, noble. God's chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God's chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things that are strong. God's chosen the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are nobodies, that are nots, the nobodies, that he might nullify the things that are, that no person should boast before God. Here's the big point. By his doing, not some super wise guy that was in your life or gal or what. By his doing, you are in Christ, who has become to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Then Paul goes on to talk about himself. You saw me when I came to you. I didn't come with superiority of speech or of wisdom. You know, it comes from some old great orator, some really smart guy. I, a matter of fact, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Just always talking about Jesus and his crucifixion, which in your eyes look weak. I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. That's Paul. He needed help. He needed people around him. It was a fearful thing. He was, you know, any given time, he was going to be whacked, right? And so that just gives you a little taste of God's perspective on calling his team. Here's the big idea. Looking out at the crowd, a little rough, bit of a rough looking group here. Y'all fit. That's, that's the point, okay? Y'all fit, all right? Uh, if, you're, if you think, you know, I'm too weak, to be a witness for Jesus, then you're perfect. Honestly, if I'm too despised, I'm too, I'm too much of a nobody, you know, to disciple somebody, to share the gospel with somebody, to see anybody come to faith in Christ. I mean, who am I? I'm a nobody. You're perfect. Anybody here going, yep, <laughs> God really got a fine when he got me, man. God just chucked me the rock and watched the show. We're going to have to work with you a little bit. There's still hope, okay? There's still hope, you know, but you know, you're the great orator, the great CEO, the great whatever. There's still hope for you, okay? God, God can still use you. It's just going to take a little work to get there. Am I reading the passage right? That's 1 Corinthians, all right? The last part of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 and into chapter 2. Here's Paul's scenario and, uh, and that, that you do have this in your, um, on your, in your sermon notes. Here's Paul's scenario. In Acts chapter 28, the last book in the, in the, the last chapter in the book of Acts. And I want you to, to get the scene because we're going to look at these, these teammates in this context. All right? They're not just in midair. These are real live people with real skin, with real, uh, you know, real central nervous system. They feel pain the same way we feel pain. Uh, they have the fears we have. They have all of that stuff going. These are human beings, probably on the, uh, from, from society's perspective, 1 Corinthians chapter, um, chapter 1, probably on the weaker side from society's perspective. This is the team that God has chosen, and this is the context in which they're operating as this letter is being written. And so I want you, to, I want us to envision this. These people that we're going to read about are with Paul in this scenario. So everybody, everybody get the picture. Acts chapter 28, verse 16. When we, uh, wait, wait, what, what does that word we mean? Luke is writing this. Luke is there. We're going, to read it. we're going to refer to him in a moment. When we entered Rome, what's just happened? Well, I'll give you a hint. Acts chapter 27 just happened. What happened in Acts 27? Remember that big old ship journey thing and everybody almost died and the ship was crushed and all of that, you know, and they, and, but God spared everybody, brought them to land. And so then they make the trek up uh, along Italy and into, into Rome, all right? So it's all of them folks, okay, drowned rats. I mean, they're just almost drowned, you know. And so we, uh, Luke was there. Um, where am I at? Verse, uh, verse uh, 28 and following. Verse 16 and following of chapter 28. 
when we enter Rome, Paul is a prisoner. Others are traveling with them in a group, including those guarding Paul and some other prisoners that were there. Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. So he's not in a dungeon. And it happened that after three days, he called together those who were leading men of the Jews. So he's got some kind of rented quarters. Probably wasn't a real nice uh, setup. But he's got a leg chain on, apparently. He's got a chain fastened somewhere. I assume it's on his leg. I don't know. Uh, and he's chained to a soldier, so he's still under guard. He's still facing the death penalty. But by this time, it's pretty obvious he's not a high-risk kind of guy that's going to be running because he really wants to witness to the emperor, all right? But just the same, you got you to keep him chained up. Uh, but he's in some kind of a rented quarters. Now, he's seen other types of incarceration, but that's where he is right now writing this. Again, probably Corinthian. Uh, 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 Colossians being written probably from Rome. We're not sure, but probably. All right? All right. Verse 17, next verse. And it happened after three days, he called together those who were leading men of the Jews. So he's able to get word out. He's under, how, he's under this house arrest kind of thing. Um, and he's able to get word out to the Jewish leaders. And why, why would that be? Because he wants, everywhere he went, he wanted to talk to the Jewish people first, then he would start talking to everybody out of respect for the Jewish people, all right? And so uh, he called them together, and they came, and he began to say to them, brethren, I haven't done anything wrong, but it's verse 20, for the sake of the hope of Israel, in other words, the Messiah, who has come to save Jew and Gentile, for his sake I am incarcerated. And I think he knew the Jewish leadership would understand uh, that it would be a horrible thing for Messiah to save Gentiles also. So they would probably get that picture. Verse 21, they say, you know, we haven't heard anything about you, so no, no letter has preceded you. So, uh, you know, we don't, we don't know anything about you. Uh, verse 23, they set a day, though, to uh, listen to him, and they came together at his lodging in large numbers. A whole lot of Jewish leaders come together. He's still chained to a soldier, we assume, but he's able to teach. And he was explaining to them and solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God, trying to persuade, yeah, only God can say, but we try to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law, that's the first five books of the Bible, and from the prophets, that's all the writings that were, uh, uh, you know, the law applied to uh, Israel through the years, from morning till evening. So he's teaching them for a long time, these Jewish uh, leaders, um, focusing on Messiah. Some of them were being persuaded by the things spoken. Others would not believe. All right, so you got kind of a rift among the uh, Jewish leadership. Don't know how many had any kind of inclination toward believing, but uh, uh, some certainly didn't. And then Paul lays on them Isaiah, uh, and this ends the book, uh, from, the, uh, from the prophet Isaiah about Israel, still true in Paul's day. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, Go to this people and say, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You'll keep on seeing, but will not perceive, because the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears, they scarcely hear. They've closed their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, return, and I heal them. Paul says, let it be known to you, therefore, that this salvation that God has sent, uh, has sent also to the Gentiles, they will listen. Uh, verse 30, and for two full years, in his own rented quarters, he was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the gospel, uh, preaching the kingdom of God, and teaching um, concerning the Lord Christ with all openness, unhindered, except for obviously the chain and confinement. All right? So, so that's the scene, and these folks are hanging out with him. So, so he's not like he's in a dungeon where they can't get to him. 
Uh, he's in some kind of rented quarters. He's, he's, again, under arrest, but he's able to continue to teach. He just can't travel the streets, and so he needs other people to help him to do that, to bring people together and uh, to share the, uh, the good news with him. And that's what he was doing for two years as he was waiting for his uh, either death sentence or release. And uh, that's, that's the scene. And so now we flip our attention to the book of Colossians and the uh, end of the letter. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 7. Everybody with me so far? Okay, so you've got to got, kind of have that in mind. Now he's writing back to this church in Colossae over in uh, Turkey, and uh, he is uh, closing the letter out with these words. As to all my affairs, first guy we look at, Tychicus. Now, I got a serious question here. Nobody has named their kid or their grandkid Tychicus. And, and I mean, that's like really troubling. There's a, there's a couple of great names. If, if you're pregnant and you haven't told us yet, or planning to get pregnant, we got, we got some good names today. We got one you don't want to use. But we got, we got some really good names. Just throwing it out there, okay? Uh, Tychicus is, that's a cool name, I think. Tick. Does that work? That works, right? Okay. All right. As to all my affairs, tick. Our beloved... So now let, let's look at the qualities. There's a lot of qualities to this guy, no doubt. But these are the ones that Paul focuses on, or we could say God through Paul focuses on. So I want to add, as, as a, so this is the time of examination. As a team player in your life, Am I this guy? Do I, do I, am I maturing in these qualities? Nobody's arrived in anything. But am I maturing in these qualities? And I could ask myself another question. Do I pull around me people, believers, with these qualities? So as we go through, let's look at what it is to be a, a team member for the Lord uh, with other Christians and the team members to look for as well. So as all my affairs, Tychicus, our beloved brother. Now, if you say beloved, well, uh, well, you actually can take off the word B-E. It sounds like we're at a funeral or something, okay? It's just in Greek, it's just loved. Okay, so just kind of cross that out. Uh, our loved brother. Somebody, now, every, every Christian's loved by other Christians uh, because, why are you loved? Because we got to love you, okay? Because we're commanded to do that, all right? Uh, so every Christian's love, but if you're going to make the statement, probably folks just kind of naturally loved this guy, even though maybe he's like most of us, maybe naturally unlovable. Um, how would people fall, how would Christians fall in love with you besides your good looks? Because you're investing in them, right? Read the love, book Love Language, a great, great book. Or better yet, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, because you're investing in other people. Show me a person who is investing. I don't care what they look like, their personality. Show me a person investing in other people, taking the t time to really invest in other people. I will show you a person that that congregation calls beloved. I want you to think about that. There's no other way to do it that I can figure out. Again, we love you because we're commanded to. But, but, but to, to really be called loved... You're investing in others. That takes time. It takes thought. And it takes time. And it takes creativity. It takes time. So he's, he's loved. All right, that's the first thing we need to learn about him. Next, faithful servant. Servant is uh, diakonos, when we forget deacon. Uh, he's, he's, he's not a deacon. He's just, a, 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 everybody's called, every Christian that's, a, that's genuine is called a, uh, almost, it's called a, a diakonos. Uh, though there is the office also, uh, our lead uh, servants. He's a servant to others. Maybe that's why he's loved. There's a thought. He's serving other people. And not just serving them, but he's faithful in serving them. So it's easy to kind of start serving somebody, and then after a while, you know how it is, like after, I don't know, like two days, you're done with that person. You're kind of tired, okay? This guy is a faithful servant. So he's serving, and he's faithful, and he, he, he carries through. He continues to serve, all right? So I got to go, is that me? And then next, a fellow, 
you could cross out the word ba, and it's not in Greek. I'm not sure why we keep putting it in. Fellow servant, that's a different word. For it. it's a, that's a word uh, for, typically we translate it slave. Slave in the Lord. So kind of that, that word fellow, though, we're serving together. So he's a guy serving other people, but he's also a guy serving with other people, I think is the idea. He's serving others. He's serving with others, unified in the Lord, and therefore he's loved. I think that's the simplest way you can take that. So I got to go, is that me? On my current trajectory in, in, in my relationship in the church, is that me? So examine yourself, if you would. It go, it, all of this is a matter of, of direction. And are you pulling people around you that are this way? All right? He will bring you information, for I have sent him to you for this very purpose that you might, two things, know about our circumstances, and he might encourage your hearts. This guy is able to encourage you. I want to send somebody back to you. It's about, I don't know, it's about a thousand miles, right? Hundreds of miles anyway. I want to send a guy who, when he arrives, that's a long trip back in the day. I want to send a guy to encourage you. And also, I want you to know how we're doing here. We read a little bit about how they were doing. So uh, he's going to bring back to the church in, Col in Colossae, where Paul had never been, apparently, but he still knew some of the believers because he did a lot of work in Ephesus, not very far away. So he's wanting to send word back to them how they're doing, and he wants their hearts to be encouraged. And he's got a guy... This guy knows how to encourage. So I got, I got to ask myself the question, do I know how to encourage other people? Or do I just have the gift of, uh, what's, that, what's that gift where you can just judge other people and call it a spiritual gift? Uh, discernment. <laughs> right? And I just, I got the gift of discernment. I don't encourage. I just got the gift of discernment. Boy, I can point out faults in other people. Right? What a great, yeah, that's, yeah, okay. Uh, no, are you, are we, am I able to encourage? Am I the type of guy that could be sent to another uh, group of believers, another house group, whatever it is, and, and, and I know, the, you know, the house, your house group that sends you to that other house group knows that you're gonna build them up and not just find faults with them. So, some good stuff to examine our hearts with. He, he's able to do that. By the way, <laughs> He's also, as he travels, he's taking with him, with his little team that's traveling, the letter of Colossa, uh, to the letter, the letter of Colossians, the letter of Ephesians, and a guy named Onesimus, and we'll talk about him in a moment. A little bit in the, little bit in the background of this guy, Acts chapter 20, verse 1. After the uproar had ceased, so this is taking place, chapter, this is after chapter 19, this is actually 20. In 19, there's a big uh, uh, ruckus, a big riot kind of thing in Ephesus. Paul had been there for a long time, and company, and uh, one of the um, uh, silversmiths is like really ticked off because his business is going down because people are like uh, going, you know, we're not worshiping idols anymore. There's, there's too many people were, were saying that, and uh, we're going to turn to Jesus. No idols uh, involved with Jesus. No, you know, there's no images whatsoever. And so uh, he's like really, uh, re he's like really hacked off, gets the whole city in an uproar, and there's a big, big uh, public scene. And after that, this guy and others continue to travel with Paul. And you'll notice in verse 4, his name is mentioned with other names. And the next thing that happens, verse 3, is a plot was formed against Paul by the Jews. He was going to hop on a boat and head for Syria. They're wanting to go back to Jerusalem, take the offering. So a plot is formed against Paul. And uh, they learned about it, so they figure, well, let's not jump on the ship because we, you know, we're, uh, uh, <laughs> we don't have any recourse on a ship. But for whatever reason, they found it, uh, you know, the cruise ship uh, a little bit less, um, less safe. And so they uh, go back by way of land. And you, if, you, if you were Tychicus, what would you be thinking? Okay, there's a whole bunch of uh, really, really, really angry, angry Jewish leaders that are wanting to whack Paul probably willing to whack anybody with him. And this guy continued to stay with Paul. Would you? Would I? Right? That whole thing of, all right, be safe. And like a complete, completely foreign to Christianity. Completely foreign to Christianity. Be faithful. 
no matter what it means. Be faithful. That's what we're called to do. All right? Uh, and uh, that's enough on ticket because there's a few other passages that have him. Um, he, was, he was a really good guy. Uh, you can jot down Titus chapter 3, verse 12, and 2 Timothy 4, 12 uh, as well. Good passages on him. Let's go to the next guy. Onesimus. Now, now who is Onesimus? Does that name ring a bell for anybody? We're going to get into Philemon if there is a, uh, you know, later on here, shortly down the road, very shortly down the road. And he was a guy that was a, uh, a slave to what, you know, what level was he? What was his education? We don't know. But um, he's traveling with Tychicus. They're coming back together. And um, he is, we'll talk about his story in just a moment. But, but uh, notice these quality. He is faithful and he is loved. So he's a, uh, I, I'll give you this part. He's a fairly new believer and as a new believer, he's loved by others that are around him. Why is that? Maybe because he's faithful. We probably could throw the word servant in as well. He's serving others in a faithful way, though he's a brand new believer. Therefore, people fall in love with him. He's investing in the lives of others. Who is one of your number? You know Onesimus. He was part, some way, shape, or form, at least bodily part of your gatherings. He was maybe a lost guy, but he was there. They will inform you about the whole situation here. So he's also trusting this new believer to share with the believers in Colossae about Paul accurately. New believer. Wasn't on the sideline. He was still in the middle of the whole thing. All right? So you might be a new believer. And you go, okay, this is, this is cool. Um, Philemon chapter 1 and verse 10, we have these words. I appeal to you, and he's talking to a guy named Philemon about Onesimus. I appeal to you for my child, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment. His name is Onesimus. So what are the chances, apparently, Onesimus skips town? He's tired of being a servant, slave, you know, for Philemon, for whatever, you know, and we'll get into that when we get into uh, um, uh, Philemon uh, in a few weeks. Uh, but he, but he, so he escapes, in essence, okay? So he splits town. Could be really serious con consequences under Roman law, I think. We're led to believe that anyway. And he figures, I'll go to Rome. Nobody's going to find, there's like two million people in Rome in the time. Right? I mean, who's going to find me there? You know, and it'll be fun, a lot of parties, it'll be different than, you know, Colossae. Yeah. And so it'll be cool, it'll be a great journey. So he goes to Rome, right? Two, I mean, what do you think about this? Providence of God. Two million people there. Paul is incarcerated in the scene we just read about. And somehow through Paul, Onesimus hears the gospel and becomes a Christian. Like, what? Like, how did that work? And we're not told, which is like, oh, man, I got to make it up. If I was a movie guy, I could make it up and, and give everybody the real reason why it happened, all the Jesus movies and stuff. But well, we're not told. Somehow, he comes across Paul with all the parties to go to, all the dance clubs, whatever, and he makes it to see Paul and becomes a Christian. So he says this, I appeal to you for my child. Paul calls him his child, whom I have begotten in my imprisonment, Onesimus who was formerly useless to you, but now useful both to you and to me. I have sent him back to you in person. That is, listen now, sending my very heart. As I send him back, I'm, it's like I'm sending my, the word is for, for soul or guts. I'm sending my emotions, my soul. That I, am, I, I love this guy. But I'm sending him back because it's the right thing to do. And again, we'll get into that more uh, um, uh, when we look at the book of Philemon. And so um, I want to keep him here that he might minister to me in my imprisonment in your behalf. But it's the right thing to send him back. And so you figure out uh, the right thing to do. This is all about grace. This is all about a guy that, has, uh, that was a lost guy. Apparently part of the church to some degree, but he was lost. Escapes. Maybe stole some stuff on the way out the door. You'd think that would be the case, right? To get a pay for the trip. And becomes a Christian now wants to go back and get things right. 
That's very, very cool. And God's going to use this guy. And one of the neat things is, is a guy named uh, Ignatius, who was one of the early church fathers, writes about him, uh, this guy in, uh, in the uh, church in Colossae, and says he became an elder. Kind of cool. Just doing the right thing. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ. Doesn't matter your economic status. Doesn't matter your past. Doesn't matter your past. All of that's forgiven in Christ. And you can be used in a powerful way. We, we got to take in this message uh, Paul the, is, 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 is on a number of occasions, 1 Corinthians 6, for example, such, listing a bunch of bad things that we do, such were some of you, but now, now you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified, and set apart for ministry. The past can be totally the past. And that's the way we believers see one another. Amen? Onesimus. Don't let your past sideline you. You can still be part of the team. Uh, Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. Aristarchus. Now, that's another cool name. By the way, Onesimus, not bad. Just throwing it out there. Aristarchus, that's a very cool name. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, sends you his greetings. Now, some would say fellow prisoner means he was just, man, he was, he was there it, with Paul in heart, and so in that sense, he was a fellow prisoner. But Paul doesn't say that about everybody. And there's a lot of other guys that were there, you know, in, with, with heart and soul doing this thing. Um, it just, I don't know. I think it seems to mean what it says. This guy was also in prison. And somewhere along the uh, route, it happened to him. Acts chapter 19, verse 28 when they heard about this, they were filled with rage. We just talked about this. And began, began crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Uh, the, the, again, this is that whole uh, silversmith thing. And the Ephesus is thrown into confusion. And the, uh, they're losing money. And the city was filled with confusion. And they rushed with one accord into the amphitheater kind of thing. Dragging along Gaius. And who's that guy? Aristarchus. So that's where we meet this guy. Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia. So they're wanting to grab Paul and whoever else, but they can't find him, so they grab Aristarchus and this other guy. Now, you say, well, that's a cute little story. No, it's really not cute. You've got an angry mob. They're, they are livid about the finances, okay? And they're losing money, and Paul and these, these, these scoundrels have turned people away from this idle stuff. They're losing a fortune on this, and they're, they're, just, they're, they're just spitting mad. And they, these guys could have, get, they, they could have been killed, all right? This big mob scene. Now, here's the cool thing. That didn't detour Aristarchus at all. He's like, now, for, for you or me, we're examining our hearts right now. If that happened to one of us, well, I, I remember when I was leaving home, my, my, uh, my family said, okay, be safe. Like, that's the big virtue. And that wasn't it. No, be faithful. This guy kept traveling with Paul and company. And he's going to meet some more junk along the way. And probably, perhaps, all the way through to imprisonment here in Rome. That's an arduous, that's a fearful journey. And so this guy was faithful. Somewhere along the way, he was arrested, apparently. Could have been in Rome, or could have been well prior to that. Somewhere along the way, he could have been one of the fellow prisoners. Somewhere he was arrested and became a fellow prisoner. Why? Because he was there with Paul a lot. Who knows? We're not told. But it didn't matter. He was faithful. All right? Next guy we're looking at, Mark. 
Colossians chapter 4, verse 10. And so again, is that, is that me? Am I willing to do that for a friend? Are we In America, we, we got it good, but um, you know, we, it's not bad to teach your kids Mandarin. I mean, we don't know where things are going to go, okay? We honestly don't. That's not a prophecy. I hope we get revival. I hope we become way more powerful as a nation than we are right now. We don't know, um, but uh, we want to raise our kids to be faithful, and we need to be faithful faithful to one another no matter what it means colossians chapter 4 verse 10 and also barnabas his cousin mark about whom you received instructions if he comes to you welcome him like why did he have to say that about this guy like wouldn't wouldn't christians just naturally welcome another christians if it's travel like a thousand miles to see him like really i gotta say that maybe there's some rumors you know how that stuff happens that Mark messed up. Did Mark mess up? Yeah, yeah, yeah kind of. Yeah, yeah. Remember the story? Um, you know, back in in um, in a book of Acts, chapter thirteen, Paul's Paul and Bar, Paul and Barnabas are heading out on a missionary journey. They 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 take Mark with them. John Mark. It could be called John. It could be called Mark in your Bible. Uh, and they travel to um, uh, Cyprus, and go through that island, share the gospel. And that was pretty. That was pretty gutsy to do that. And then they're heading for the mainland, for, for, for Turkey. And what happens there? Mark's like, I'm out of here. It was just too, we don't know. Homesickness, too dicey, too dangerous. For whatever reason, Paul wasn't pleased. And so uh, after the first missionary journey, they're praying and they're getting prepared. They're going to do a second missionary journey. And and Barnabas is going, great, I'll text Mark, and he'll get ready, and we'll, uh, you know, we'll give him the departure date, and everything. We're, that's good, you know. And Paul's going, it's not going to happen. He, he's not going. He, he, you know, basically, he flaked out the first time. It's not going to happen. He's not going with us. And there was such a disagreement, uh, doesn't mean they were hitting each other, but just there's a strong, such a strong disagreement that uh, Paul wasn't going to take uh, Mark, but Barnabas did. So they, they split company, and Barnabas and Mark and whoever else went uh, you know, on a missionary journey, and then Paul grabbed Silas and whoever else, and they went on a missionary journey. So what's this thing about Mark now being with Paul? 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is the last chapter in, 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 that Paul wrote in his life, apparently. Make every effort to come to me soon, Timothy. Demas, having loved this present world, has departed and gone to Thessalonica. Uh, Cre uh, Cretans has gone to Galatia, Titus to uh, Dalmatia. It doesn't mean they, they, uh, they forsook him. It means they were on journeys to do ministry, help the churches there. Only Luke is with me. That's, that, that's going to be, it's an interesting guy. Pick up Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. Well, Paul, I thought you didn't want Mark around. Yeah, but Barnabas did. And Barnabas brought him along. And then we got a little word in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13. Uh, Peter calls Mark his son. Evidently, Peter, Peter, did Peter know anything about, about goofing up? Yeah, like a little bit. Yeah, it's like I, you can see Peter going, um, Mark, yeah, I've kind of gone through this, and Jesus, you know, kind of brought me through this. I can probably help you out here, okay? Yeah, so we've got a couple of guys, Barnabas and Peter, helping Mark out, discipling him, bringing him along. And here at the end of, of uh, Paul's life, Paul's going, man, I could really use Mark to help me in ministry as part of the team here. If you, man, if you can get him to come, that would be very, very cool. And so that's Mark. So what's the point? If you've messed up big time, if you've denied knowing Jesus like Peter, today's a new day. God can use you on the team in ministry. Next guy, Justice. Justice, I just saw Justice, there's Justice right up here. Justice right up here. Um, Justice, we don't know anything about you, man. We, we don't know. I mean, it just, it just says, and also Jesus, although that's pretty cool. It's just, it's a hard name to live up to. So this is Jesus, who is also called Justice, because it'd be hard to live up to the name Jesus, I guess. And so, some, one of us here is the least known person, right? We don't know, we don't know who this Justice was. I mean, we know Justice today. 
Uh, but we, we don't know who this guy was, and so maybe he's the least known on the list. Somebody here is the least known. Whoever, we don't know who it is. You know, but whoever it is, God can use you. Okay, everybody good? You might get kind of quiet, you know, not stand out, whatever. God can use you on the team. All right, so that's justice. And then um, oh, he goes on to say, these are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, the Jewish people, and they have proved to be an encouragement or a comfort to me. Um, that, I, I read Acts chapter 28, the end of chapter 28, bringing up the prophecy of Isaiah to say that Paul is witnessing the Jewish people first, and it's kind of a sad statement to say, not many of them apparently came to faith in Christ. Think about that. And yet it was still the right, respectful thing to do. Acts 28. So that's why I read that portion of Acts 28. All right? Uh, Paul didn't have a ton of people around him. Next guy. But he traveled with people. With faithful people. All right? But it wasn't like the center of the party. By any stretch. In Colossians chapter 1, we're going to look at Epaphras. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 7, he says this. You learned, you folks in Colossae, learned the grace of God in truth from Epaphras. So that kind of implies, in the beginning of this letter, that Epaphras was the first or among the first believers to be in Colossae. And so apparently he, and maybe some others with him, planted the church. Maybe he was the pastor of the church. Kind of spoken like he is the, you know, or I should say one of the pastors, one of the elders of the church. So Epaphras, who is one of your number, he just listed his way, he's, he's, one, he's, he's one, he may be a lead guy, but he's one of the elders, one of the pastors of the church, apparently, certainly the founder of the church, but he's just called one of your number. No, there's no big hierarchy in the church. He's just, you know, just not, it's not the pastor Epaphras. It's just, he's one of your number. He's a team player. I think that's just a cool phrase. One of your, one of your key leaders, but he's just one of your number. A bond slave of Jesus Christ sends you his greetings. And this is what's cool about this guy. And we talked about this earlier because this was exactly, almost exactly what was said about Paul, or Paul said about himself. Always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers. So why is that? Well, he's praying that you stand perfect and fully assured in all the will of God. Remember we talked about that last week? Uh, that, that you know God's will, that you stand in great assurance in the will of God. For I bear him witness talking about one of your elders, and I want you all to know, even though he's away from you, that he has a deep concern for you and for those who are in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Well, you say, well, if he's got a deep concern for them, why is he spending time away from them? Philemon, chapter 1, verse 23, we have these words. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner. Hmm. Evidently, took a little pastoral journey, be with Paul for a little bit, was arrested. Don't know how it went down. Loves y'all, wants to be there, can't. But he wants, like, this is the pastor's, this is the elder's heart, this is a Christian's heart. He wants you all to know the will of God and be solid and secure in the will of God. And he's just agonizing in prayer that God would work this in your midst. Isn't that cool? Is that my heart? Is that our hearts? And then Luke is a, uh, <laughs> a good guy. Um, Acts chapter, well, verse 14 of Colossians 4. Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings. He's also loved. Why? Because he spends time with people. He cares for people. Probably as a doctor and as a Christian. He sends you greetings also. Uh, in Acts chapter 27, this is an illustration in the book of Acts. And when it was decided that we should set sail for Italy, that's that big ship journey that we talked about, what's the we doing there? Every time in the book of Acts you read the word we, that would include Luke. When you have the words, they traveled here, they did this, they did that, he's not with them. But when you read in the book of, uh, of um, and God used him to write the, the uh, Gospel of Luke as, as well as Acts, whenever you read the word we, 
Luke is with them. And here's the interesting thing you'll pick up on. In the first missionary journey, Paul speaks about, in, in the book of Galatians chapter 4, he speaks about uh, having a bodily infirmity, and that's why they went from the coastal area of Turkey in that first missionary journey upwards uh, to, for, for, for physical reasons for Paul, he was suffering with some kind of an infirmity. And um, uh, on the second missionary journey and following, we see Luke with Paul a lot. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, chapter 12, he writes about bodily infirmities that God didn't take away from him. He, he was suffering from num probably numerous things, physical conditions. And Luke, through to the end, I'm sure he had some uh, times away, but we see Luke with him a lot all the way into the last letter he wrote, which is 2 Timothy, where Paul's going to be uh, beheaded shortly thereafter. That's cool, isn't it? You know, that's, that's just, he's traveling with his doctor. And so that's Luke. And Luke could have had, no doubt, a very lucrative uh, career as a doctor wherever, put up a shingle and, you know. But instead, Luke pulls up stakes and he travels with Paul, using his gifting for the kingdom of God. And we're going to put a comma there. And we are the ne next week we're planning to uh, just complete this. Um, I, I, that, that's all positive stuff. Demas, not quite as much so. So but, but we'll, we'll, we'll uh, do the last few verses and then try to review the book. Get the big ideas out of the book next time we get together. Team. Am I a team player? For God's team. Very different requirements than for most teams uh, on the planet. Am I moving? Is God moving my heart, my soul, my practice, my t use of time? Is God moving me as a team player? Thank you, Father, for your grace to us. Thank you for teammates that you've placed around us in our lives. Thank you for teammates in life groups. Thank you for teammates on ministry teams. Thank you for teammates in this church. And uh, thank you, Father, for some of us who travel to other places and work in other places. Teammates waiting for us there. But the great privilege to not walk the Christian life alone, but to do it as a team. Lord Jesus, show us our own hearts. These qualities are not really hard to figure out, and yet they are costly. It costs us a lot of time and can be dangerous. Lord Jesus, guide us to be team players on your team and to be able to look back from eternity future saying that we left it on the field, gave it our all with our team. In Jesus' name, amen. We spoke about the gospel earlier. Christ died for your sins. Trust him as your Savior and Lord. Receive the gift of eternal life and then begin to walk with him and with his team. We invite you to do that. I'll be down here. Other leaders as well uh, come and pray with us. God bless each one of you. God make you a blessing.